Good morning and welcome. My name is Amanda Strauss, and I'm the Associate University Librarian for Special Collections and the director of John Hay Library. It is my sincere honor to welcome you to Voices of Mass Incarceration, a symposium. This gathering marks the opening of Mumia Abu Jamal's archival collection to research. Created over more than 40 years in the inhumane confines of his cell, his vast collection provides crucial insight into the US carceral system and maps his intellectual production. Mumia's essays alone cover major events ranging from the election of Barack Obama to the Ferguson protests, the resignation of British Prime Minister Tony Blair, and economic troubles in Zimbabwe. He delves into early America, writing about the role of black soldiers in the American Revolution, and engages with theorists as varied as Franz Fanon, Noam Chomsky, and Selma James. It is only fitting that we begin today in the archives with an excerpt from an original essay, Art and Incarceration, by Mumia Abu-Jamal. When we consider art and incarceration, this originally sounds like an oxymoron, a stunning incongruity. But in fact, these drab, colorless human storage boxes are bursting with art. For those with an eye to see, the arts are bursting through like sunlight on Easter morning. There is a stunning amount of talent behind these walls, more than I believed. Incarceration unleashes hidden talents in those caged. I've seen drawings in pencil or pen, paintings in watercolor or acrylic, even sculptures of truly amazing craft, skill, and vision, artworks that could proudly be exhibited in any gallery or museum in America made by prisoners, and poetry to make you wonder or weep, hidden behind brick and steel, in shadowed cell, alone in twilight at times. Art is that which makes us human, and in this place, in the most inhuman of places, art yet lives, colorful, resplendent, magical, echoes of creativity, yet lives. I walk the same route on campus nearly every day, and there is a particular brick wall that I pass, and in most seasons there manages to be a determined plant growing in the mortar. It is one of the small wonders that those of us on the outside enjoy. When reading Mumia's words, I thought of this image in my mind's eye, and my sense of wonder grew. Life cannot be contained by constructed walls, no matter how inhospitable the material, life will find a way to take root and grow. The intellect, the creativity, the humanity of those who are incarcerated cannot be extinguished even under the vast weight of the US carceral system. For the next two days, you will be offered the opportunity to hear from leading scholars, activists, musicians, poets, and artists as we consider the history of the US prison system, how to create public spaces of healing, the impact of policing on the carceral system, medical care in the carceral state, and gender, justice, and healing. Threaded throughout the program are stories of hope, renewal, and humanity. Stories that stretch our imaginations about the lived realities of incarceration and the breathtaking human potential that transcends this reality. And what I have learned from those who are engaged in scholarship and activism around changing this system is that we must first expand our own minds if we are to imagine a world where prisons are not a central part of our society. I invite you to be present, to be reflective, to be open, you will have a chance to interact with panelists during question and answer sessions and during breaks. And I hope you also talk with each other. I invite you to take advantage of the reflective spaces we have in the building that are noted in the printed program. And if you are so moved to contribute those reflections to the archives. This symposium is anchored in the archives, in the preservation of the collection of Mumia Abu Jamal and in creating space to preserve many other related collections. 
that when assembled together, allow us to hear the voices of the incarcerated. It is up to us, the archivists, the scholars, the activists, the students, the faculty, the citizens. What will we do with these voices? How will we heed their call for justice? For me, the work of archives is fundamentally tied to the work of justice. One of the most ex poignant expressions of this that I have read is by Vern Harris, director of archive and dialogue at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, who said, archivists, wherever they work and however they are positioned, are subject to the call of and for justice. For the archive can never be a quiet retreat for professionals and scholars and craftspersons. It is a crucible of human experience, a battleground for meaning and significance, a babble of stories, a place and a space of complex and ever-shifting power plays. The work of justice is never complete. It is courageous, engaged work. It is sacred work that requires us to be fully present in our humanity. I'd like to invite Reverend Delphine Demosthenes to provide an invocation, an invitation to sacred centered space as we enter this symposium. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful and heartwarming sight to witness people from diverse backgrounds and identities social economic status, political beliefs, race, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliations, and those with secular tradition, coming together in the sacred, hallowed spaces at Brown University for this conference theme, Voices of Mass Incarceration. I extend a warm greeting to all of you. It is an honor for me to offer the invocation. I wish to express my deepest gratitude to God, to each of you, and to the conference organizers for affording me this opportunity. In our lives, we often encounter challenges that appear insurmountable, issues too intricate, too entrenched for us to address. The problem of mass incarceration in America presently seem to be one of one of such daunting challenge. Nevertheless, this week, I'm standing here with gratitude knowing that in the face of this harsh reality, we are not retreating or evading the issue. Instead, in this conference, we are choosing to confront it directly, despite our limitation or even the potential for controversy. Folks, we are doing it. In the depth of my heart, I hold a profound belief that our presence at this conference holds immense significance. This significance is rooted in both our religious, spiritual, and social convictions. Many of our religious traditions, including Christianity, call upon us to remember those who are incarcerated as if we were in prison alongside with them, to advocate for those who are suffering as if we ourselves were enduring the suffering. In our scriptures, we are called to embrace goodness in our actions, to pursue justice diligently, to extend assistance to those in need, to support the homeless, to advocate for defenseless, to love mercy, and to walk with our God humbly. Furthermore, we discuss what we discuss here holds profound social significance. The decision we'll make following this conference can and will have far-reaching social impacts. Our choices have the potential to positively transform the lives of many individuals. As Mumia Abu-Jamal astutely implores us, and his essay, Spirit Death, we must reconsider the role and function of the American prison system. We must contemplate what truly serves the best interests of our society and the incarcerated. 
Hence, wherever you are in society, whatever role you are playing in our legal justice ecosystem, your voices, your actions matter. This conference matter. So as you prepare your hearts and minds and bodies for this important work ahead in the next couple of days, I extend an invitation to those of you who are people of prayer to join me in a moment of prayer. I also hold profound respect for those who do not believe in a higher power nor practice prayer. Regardless of your spiritual beliefs, I encourage you to engage either in prayer or meditation in whatever form that resonate with you. Let us pray or meditate. God of our ancestors, we come before you burdened by the troubling truth that our nation leads the world in incarceration rates. More than two million of your children are behind bars. We dip disparities along racial, gender, and income lines. We mourn the racial injustices deeply rooted in this system. We acknowledge our complicity in a culture that devalues individuals, relegating them to a second-class status. We lament the inadequacy, the inadequacy of a legal system that often punishes without considering the need of those harmed. Spirit of the living God, we pray for those who are unjustly in prison, for those who have made mistakes and are seeking redemption. We offer our prayers for the children and the loved ones of those who are impacted by the separation caused by incarceration, understanding that its consequences extend far beyond the prison walls. We also pray for those who are reintegrated into society after serving their sentences, asking for strength, support, and opportunities for them to again fully make their contribution in society. God, it is easy to turn away from this issue when it does not directly touch our lives, but we call by our faith to act. Lord, we ask you to disturb our peace Break our hearts for the suffering, the injustice that plagues our communities. Give us the strength and the courage to confront this issue with compassion, empathy, and relentless commitment to justice. Help us to see the humanity in every individual, regardless of their past mistakes, and to work towards a society where rehabilitation, restoration are valued over punishment and retribution. Grant us the courage to advocate for justice, to work towards a more compassionate society. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Marcus Grant, a professional drummer, percussionist, musicologist and educator. Marcus is a current PhD student in the musicology department and along with his ensemble will perform Vampire Nation, an original music composed by Mumia Abu-Jamal. This is the first time that this music is ever being performed. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you all for being here this morning. I'm so happy to be here to perform this music for you. First of all, thank you to the folks at the Hay Library, Dr. Chris West and Amanda Strauss for trusting me with this task. It's been an incredible five months working on this, uh, digging into the life of of Mumi Abu Jamal, and also collaborating with my colleagues here on here on stage. Please put your hands together for Leland Baker on tenor saxophone. Kwaku Agari on the bass. Camila Cortina on piano. 
and Tariq McDowell on vocals. This has been a collective uh, and a, a combined effort to put this music together, and we're so happy to bring this to you. Special thanks to my research assistant, Ryan Witch. And, and to all of you for being here again. Last but not least, thank you to Mumia for this, for this music. This music is split into three pieces. The first piece is an overture, followed by Vampire Nation, and we'll end um, with a song called On, On a Move. If you look at the last page of your pamphlet, the lyrics to Vampire Nation are, will be uh, printed there, and there will be some visual aids on the screen to help you through this process. We thank you for your attentiveness, we thank you for being here, and we thank you for your energy as we as we do this work. Thank you. master to investigate how the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office is handling the Mumia Abdul-Jamal case. Mumia Abul Jamar will find out. Jamal will find out today whether he'll be getting a new trial.
as if some minor protest and hunger strike. The routine became 22 hours in the cell and two hours outside. That endured for years. And then a United Nations expert, Juan Mendez, the body special rapporteur on torture, issued an official opinion declaring that any amount of time past 13 days in solitary confinement constituted irreparable damage to the psyche and thus violated international law. Because of the police ban, riots are inevitable, and blame may be laid at the feet of those claim to be peace officers who brutalize the people they are sworn to serve.
Thank you, Marcus and Ensemble. That was absolutely incredible. If you've ever doubted that there is magic in the archives, I hope that that doubt has been put to rest and that this is the reason that we preserve papers like the collection of Mumia Abu Jamal so that new knowledge and new art can be created. So today, when we open this collection to research as a Carnegie Library, it is open to the public. I hope you will come and you too will explore the art that has made possible even in incarceration. Thank you again, Marcus. We're gonna take a short 12 minute break and return at 10.45 for our first panel. We have a special treat that LV, the campus service dog, is going to come for a visit. She loved pats and selfies and all kinds of hugs. Thank you so much. <laughs>